Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, sorry, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw that two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbiani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said all these things to her. This end is the reading for today. So as we come together this morning, we do so to worship our Savior Jesus Christ. It's clear why we're here today, right? We've come together to proclaim that he is risen. We've come together to share the joy that is Christ's victory over death. We have come together to offer our thanks for the salvation that he has given to us. Oh boy, now what? What, what should I talk about for the next 20 minutes? Did, did you guys see that the Pirates swept the Red Sox this week? A few weeks ago, when we had our service on the Sunday after Daylight Savings, uh, I started the, the service by asking the congregation what Sunday they thought the hardest day to preach would be. And the answer I got from most of the church was either Easter or Christmas. And I told them, no, the hardest day is actually the Sunday after Daylight Savings because of that hour of sleep we missed because I know they're tired and so am I. But the second hardest Sunday to preach, for me at least, is Easter and the third is Christmas. And you might be thinking, well, why would it be so hard to preach on Easter, Pastor? Shouldn't that be an easy day for you to preach? Well, it is, is it because the church has more people on average during Easter Sunday? Does that make it harder for you? Well, no, if there were one or 100 of you here today, uh, it wouldn't make a difference to me. I'd give you the same message that God put on my heart that week. So if it's not the people that make it more hard, what could it possibly be? Well, the answer is me. I am the one that makes Easter preaching so hard. And you might just say to yourself, well, if that's the case, then just don't make it that hard. 
As I was speaking with a member uh, at Clients Grove last week after Palm Sunday, he said to me, you know, I bet this week is the hardest week of the year for you. I told him he's right. In most weeks, I prepare one sermon. Uh, in the week between Palm Sunday and Easter, I prepare three sermons and two short sermonettes. Uh, and if you're praying that this is one of the short sermonettes, sorry, this is one of those longer three sermons that I do uh, during this time. Now, is it that I have extra sermons to prepare during the week of Easter? Is that what makes it more difficult to preach? No, it's not really what makes it more, more difficult for me. As I said, the problem is me. And you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, we know the problem is you. We hear you preach all year long. We know exactly where the problem is. But the problem is that on Easter, I have to get out of the way. I have to make sure that I'm not distracting from the most important miracle that has ever happened in this world. I have to make sure that I'm not taking away from celebrating Jesus, our risen Savior. Have you ever known someone that no matter what they do, they always seem to want to do it the hard way? I had a young man on one of my baseball teams uh, one time, and he was determined to be a right-handed hitter. Everyone else on the team that year was a righty, and so he was going to be a righty as well. Well, the problem is the young man was actually left-handed. Uh, and so he should have been hitting from that si the other side of the plate. His mechanics were all wrong because he just knew that he was a righty. I spent a lot of time trying to convince him he would do much better from the other side of the plate, um, even having him hit from that side a couple times and showing him, hey, look, you're making contact where when you bat right-handed, you couldn't hit a ball off a tee. But in the end, I simply gave up and let him hit the way he wanted to because there was just no changing his mind. And this past week, I was spending some time uh, fishing. And as I was sitting by the creek, I noticed a very large turtle on the opposite side of the bank. I mean, he's like this big across the back. And I found myself paying more attention to that turtle than to what I was actually doing. And I watched as this turtle struggled on the other side of the bank, and he came to a tree that kind of juts out into the water. And I watched as he struggled to climb up over onto this tree, and I thought to myself, well, he must be trying to get onto that tree so that he can bask in the sun, because that's something that turtles like to do. And I watched him as he climbed up, and he slipped, and he fell back down the, the tree several times. And once he finally made it to the top of the tree, I thought, He's good. He finally made it. What a, what a great way to persevere. But he didn't stop for one second. He climbed right down the other side of that tree and continued on down the other bank. Now, I was completely dumbfounded. Why didn't that turtle just swim around the tree? If he was just going to go down the other side of the creek, why didn't he just swim around the tree? Why put all the effort into climbing up and over the tree? It's not a big creek, and honestly, given enough time to stretch and uh, proper motivation like a bear chasing me, I could probably jump from one side to the other and clear it. You see, he could have easily swam around that obstacle and been on the other side, but he wasted so much time and energy climbing over that tree. See, that young man that I had for baseball and that turtle, they could have chosen a much easier path but they were determined to do things the hard way. You know, sometimes we live our lives just like that. We waste so much time and energy doing things the hard way when there is such an easier way of doing something. For me this week, as I was preparing our sermon, I wanted to delve deep into the story of Jesus. I wanted to show you how much I had worked and studied and, and chosen and crafted the perfect words for this important Sunday. And I wanted you to hear what God had put on my heart. The problem is that when a pastor takes that approach, he's forgotten that that story doesn't start with I. Did you catch what I said previous to that? I wanted to show you. I wanted to do. I wanted to craft. Well, it isn't about me. It's about Jesus, and it's about how he has conquered death. I think we'd all do well to remember that in our lives, to live much less about I and much more about Jesus. 
But do you find yourself doing the same thing in your life? Are you fighting a battle that's already been won? See, too often in our lives, we want to believe that we can be the ones to dig ourselves out of the hole we might find ourselves in. We can get out of a situation or a place if we just work harder. We can get ahead if we just buckle down and pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. Now, that is not a bad way to approach life. We know this, right? We value people that work hard. We value people that do their jobs well. But the problem becomes for us when we start believing that that is the answer to everything. See, there is no way for us to work our way out of death. Oh, you can work yourself to death, but you can't work your way out of death. There's no way for you to bear down and save your soul from the darkness. There is nothing that we can do on our own that can stop the ending we're heading for. We can't struggle up that tree and come down the other side all by ourselves. So allow me to get out of the way this morning and tell you the best news that you will ever hear. There was a man that has already paved the way for us. Not just a man, but God that came and chose to come to earth, born of a virgin. He came to this world and he lived as one of us, experienced what it was like to be human. While he was here, he, fi- he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. He was betrayed by one of his followers. He suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified and died prepared by burial, for burial by some of his followers and laid into a new tomb that was sealed with a heavy stone. And on the third day, when some of his followers came back to check on the tomb, they found that it was empty because he had risen from the dead. He had conquered death. His name was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He did all this so that we could be free of sin and have a life everlasting with him and his father. You see, that is what today is. It is the day to tell the story of the resurrection of Jesus and what his life, his death, and that resurrection means for all of us. There is nothing else that I could tell you that could ever compare to that. It's the greatest story that's ever been told, and the best thing about that story is that it's true. So I have to ask you today, in your own life, are you tired of fighting against the darkness? Are you worried about where the end of the road is headed for you? Well, you can stop. Because you see, Jesus has already won that battle for you. It's time for you to give those things up to him and let his victory shine through your life. If you've never given your life to Jesus, all you have to do is pray to him a simple prayer. Lord, come into my life. I claim you as my Savior. I ask you to forgive my sins, and I know you're the only one who can. Lead me in your ways and be with me all of my days. Now, I know that sometimes we struggle with doing that because we think to ourselves, I'm not good enough. I need to get this or that right in my life before I come before Jesus Christ. Well, I have a question for you all this morning. Did you put on your Sunday best and then hop into the shower? Did you? No. Did you get a shower and then put on your Sunday best? Hopefully, right? Depending on how much time you had, right? But no, uh, we don't get all dressed up and perfect and then go get clean. See, we get clean and then we get dressed up and perfect. So we don't come to Jesus in our best already and then he cleans us. No, he cleans us and then we get ready. Then we get in our best. So don't let the fact that you have something in your life that you think Jesus disapproves of stop you from accepting his salvation. Accept his salvation, and then he and you will work on that together. If you've already accepted Jesus as your Savior, then stop taking on the hard things in your life that you don't need to. Jesus has you. He is there to walk with you throughout your life, through the highs, the lows, the hills, and the valleys. And he has already gone to his father's house to prepare a place for you. Don't miss your chance to be with him. Amen.